Welcome to the Be Better broadcast, where we come at you to bring you tips and strategies and techniques that will help you to live an even more extraordinary life and take steps towards self-mastery in whatever area of life that you're focused on right now. You know, we love to bring you experts in so many different fields, and today we are doing just that. Today, we're going to be talking with Sharon Valenti, and I'll introduce her in a second, and we're going to be talking about how you can master your thoughts and emotions. We talk a lot about emotions on this show, and emotions are something where it's almost taboo in today's world to talk about emotions. You talk about emotions, and people's eyes start to glaze over, or at least it can seem that way. However, emotions are literally what is curating your life, because the way that you feel determines the actions that you then take. If you're not feeling too great, you're not going to take quality and effective actions to get the result that it is that you want. And the more that you can move from this state of disconnection to a state of being connected with your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions, the more personal power that you wield for yourself. And to talk all about thoughts and emotions and her own experiences and moving from disconnected to connected, today we're going to be talking with Sharon Valenti. And for those who don't know Sharon, Sharon's thirst for knowledge has led her to spend time in various places around the United States, as well as a journey throughout India and the shores and villages of Indonesia. Constantly pursuing her own awakening, she is motivated to help others do the work and seek a shift within themselves. Sharon has always had an innate nature for helping others and through deep self-inquiry processes and intensive contemplation has been successful in helping other people to do the same. Sharon's mission is to live authentically and it rings true in everything that she does. Her ability to help others do the same makes her a gifted teacher and she's here to spend time with us today. Sharon, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Brandon. It's a delight for me to be here and share with your audience and yourself. Right back at you. And w based on these things we're talking about, when it comes to thoughts and emotions and you saying that you've been to India and then you mentioned Bali before the show, tell me about your trips to these different places and how it relates to what it is that you practice and what it is you study. So both trips actually had different functions. The first one, unbeknownst to us, was going to be a um, spiritual trip, for lack of a better word. We, we teamed up with a group who followed Paramahansa Yogananda, who wrote Autobiography of a Yogi, and we did not know that. So it was really more of a pilgrimage. And what we observed in India was what we would deem in our Western world, extreme poverty in the material things. In the areas that we were in, there was a wealth, there was a abundance isn't even the right word, of a spiritual feeling. There were prayers throughout the day and it was palpable. It, we went there with our judgmental Western way, <laughs> thoughts and um, judgments. And the one thing that stood out really in my mind was this young boy who had no legs and had been get, got sat out each morning on a blanket soliciting money. And this was in Rish Rishikesh. And one day, and I had seen him and my heart was like, oh, that poor kid, he's living, you know, a traumatic life, blah, 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 again, the Western judgment. And monkeys stole the bananas that I was carrying to give to the cows that day. And he had evidently seen it. And the next day when I went back down there with another bunch of bananas, but hidden this time, he stopped me and he said, hey, lady, that was so funny yesterday. Da, 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 da. And it just immediately shifted my perspective. And, and that's all life is, is our perspective on anything combined with the story. I mean, I had a story about him, a different story one day and a completely different story the next day. And as we went through India and encountered the people and the culture and the happiness that was evident in everybody, I mean, everybody was happy. And we're like, gosh, you know, we have all this stuff back home. And most people are <laughs> Are unhappy. You don't appreciate that fridge that you have, or the fact you're not eating out of a garbage pile, or, 
or anything that maybe the most you have is chai tea all day and a beggar's bowl. And we saw lots of that. And they didn't mind. They didn't have a second thought about that. You know, we're like, oh, my God, if we don't have the nice car and the nice job and our life is nothing. And again, it's just our thoughts behind that. And it was the same in Bali. We actually went to the shaman that uh, Julia Roberts went to and eat love and honey. <laughs> and uh, that he sticks it, I think it's a bone, he sticks it into your foot and it's quite painful, actually. So I don't know about, did we have any revolutionary insights as a result of it, but apparently he did. And it was just the experience of everything in the beautiful countryside and the, the rice fields everywhere. Again, just watching their attention not be on material things, but be more in the spiritual realm. And I'm not saying we all have to pray suddenly or if you're if you're not into the prayers, but it's just a different mindset. They are not um, creating stories in life like there's a tendency to do in the Western world. And I'll keep it confined actually to the United States and what I witness here. And I'm originally from England and grew up in Europe. So I've got hmm. a bit of that in on my side as well. It's noticing and it's hard not to compare. Hmm. It's not good to compare of where our mind tends to be focused here versus where I saw the mind focus there. There was such a peacefulness in India and Bali when you took your judgment out of it, when you just stepped into it. And after the first day, especially in India, you just took it all in and you moved into acceptance. This is their country, their life, and just enjoy every moment of it. And we did, we were very blessed to be on that trip. Um, India, I mean, uh, Bali, we went for the purpose of learning how to read. To, we were getting training on Akashic Records, so that was a part of the trip. But the other part, as I said, was visiting. It seemed like every family in Bali had their own little temple, and they worshipped in there every day. So it was delightful. Thanks for going into detail. Well, well done with the storytelling there, because I literally saw the experience as you went through it and relived it. That is so true how you go there and you're very familiar with the way that we Westerners live our life and the things that we have and our routines. And then you see what they're doing. And I haven't been there, so I'm living it just off your experiences here. You go there and you see an individual where we our mind immediately goes to oh they must be in misery they must be suffering they must not have enough when really these people are in more of a state of bliss than we are with all of the different material possessions and even the education that we possess so let me ask you because i'm really curious i love how you said how their mind is more focused on the peacefulness because they have this ability or this mental muscle of removing that judgment so how how long did it take for that judgment to to kind of wash off of you and how how can we wash that judgment off ourselves so i feel one of the most troublesome things that we can do to ourselves is to compare ourselves and daily we do that even from the moment when you get up and you get dressed for work you think you're dressing for yourself and unconsciously, you're dressing for how you think you're going to be perceived by the people that you meet throughout the day. And that really will take, take charge of your life. If you were to let that go, probably the most comfortable we are in any given day is when we're in our pajamas. If <laughs> right? I mean, you just, your whole body, your whole mindset is changed because you're not in a comparing mode there, right? You're in a total chill mode that it is comparing ourselves to everybody else. How am I going to show up at work? Am I going to be better than the colleague? Is the boss going to love me today? Hate me today? Da, 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 da. We just torment ourselves there after, literally after that second day in Rishikesh, seeing the delight in that young man and he doesn't care whether he has legs or not. He's just happy, happy, happy. And his whole life revolves around eternity, really, because their their philosophy is that we are eternal. I mean, we say we're eternal here. I don't know how much belief there is behind that. 
um, for me, it's our consciousness that's eternal. We literally got to go down into Varanasi, which is where the, the uh, uh, I forget what they're called, but there's only certain people that are allowed to burn the bodies. So they bring their dead to these areas and the bodies are stacked on racks. And we actually took a boat ride and saw that occurring. And it was a, um, a true celebration of life. There was no the sobbing and crying and making death about me. It's, it's life after life. And so being able to experience that, and we literally sat in caves where Baba Ji had meditated for years and years and where the Ganesh God was a little tiny cave. Actually, that was a bit tight in there. And I noticed my thoughts while I was there because a few steps up on the mountain, I can't remember the other person's name, but they channeled the information to Ganesh. And, and my thought was, why didn't they just walk down the hill? But that's not the way it works there. And so catching my thoughts like that was very interesting because I thought, this is how they are. Stay out of the judgment. And they're so, I'm not saying they're not hungry because they are. There's a lot of starvation going on over there, but there's a happiness to everybody there, really. Even the animals with mange were happy. I mean, it was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really it's that difference of perspective and like I said I've never been there and that's why I asked these questions because I've read books about people who've traveled there and they go seeking enlightenment and really it's it really sounds like that enlightenment is simply being with yourself shedding that idea of comparison the idea that you have to show up a certain way to be perceived and looked at a certain way removing that sense of judgment from our life so it's yeah. really refreshing to hear you explain your experience there. Was it very similar in Bali? Were, were there any different realizations that you came away from Bali with? Uh, we stayed in Ubud and then traveled with a group way up into the mountains there. So we saw a lot of things that you don't ever question, like how they were drying the cloves and the rice fields, never seen that in operation. So that was a bit fascinating. Ubud was quite westernized, I must say had one of the most beautiful Starbucks I've ever wow. seen. But as we went out into the country and saw more of the day-to-day -day life, yes, it was similar in its way to, to India. Um, I didn't feel as much of a poverty level as I did in India. Um, apparently, uh, Bali had been broken into seven states, if I remember, and they had seven kings at one time. So it was very different than India. But the people themselves, again, that very spiritual quality, they perhaps had more to compare to because they're more used to seeing Westerners in parts of the country we went to in India. They hadn't experienced that many Westerners. I was reading from an iPad, uh, Paramahansa's story, and there were some youngsters, <clears throat> this was in India, <coughs> excuse me, and I flicked the page and the kid looked underneath the iPad to see where the page had gone. You know, I never even thought about it until that moment. Where does that page go? But again, things that we take for granted, right? I've never questioned where those pages go. They just go. <laughs> and they've never even seen an iPad. So it was it was like a new appreciation for the iPad, actually, after that. So, uh, yeah, and it again, in those areas, they've never had anything to compare to. Mm -hmm. So how could, they, how could they know to even miss something if they've never seen it? We saw, we saw up in the mountains, they'd had a, a fluke thing of nature happening. This gigantic boulder was in the road, and there were about 20 people with chisels and hammers to break it down because they don't have the equipment like we do that could swing that boulder off. So to open the road, they had to get that away. We pay to go to museums here to see those kind of tools. There, it's their way of life in those particular areas. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. Imagine if we were able to keep that sense of mysticism of the things that were like this microphone, the laptop that I'm l looking at currently, like the projector screen, like all these things that we just take for granted, even a canister to hold water and pictures and art and clothing and, and language and all these things that we've just grown accustomed to. And we forget to think 
I had to learn these things at one point, right? Other people don't have the luxuries of these things. So as you're interacting with, with these people, the difference in their own emotional state, because it seems that they're much more okay with where they are than a lot of people over here in our Western culture. We know that it's because they lack that sense of comparison because it, they don't really know what to compare it to. But are these individuals doing anything else differently when it comes to their emotional, mental state that we could also benefit from should we begin to practice? So there was a, a considerable amount of meditation. And I'll be honest, I am, I'd like to think I meditate. I don't. I don't do anything on a regular basis. Well, we went to one particular ashram that was around the Arunandal Mountain, and which was, again, supposed to be a spiritual mountain that if you walked around it eight times, good fortune, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. But in this, in this ashram, we happened to, it was a, Again, quite an experience, and the monks, I think they were called, in the orange outfits, had a begging bowl, and whatever was put into that bowl was the food they ate for the day. And I went into this big hall where people were meditating, and I just sat on the floor, and I just said whatever they said. I Honestly, that was an experience. I felt like I had – everything just stopped except that moment of chanting, and it – I can't say it was a, I don't know what it was. It was lovely. It was absolutely, and I thought I could sit here all day and do this because I've never felt so centered and calm. And even when I tried to do meditation outside of there, so whether it's just that whole energetic field over that country, because everybody's doing it throughout the day, they'd be on the temple steps just praying and the cows would be right beside them. And, you know, the cows are sacred in India and, uh, and they were lovely too. I, I love the cows feed one 20 suddenly appear, you know, it was like <laughs> feed for one banana or one cabbage. It was incredible that it was just that constant humbling of oneself. I mean, to me, that's what prayer is you, or more meditation. You're humbling yourself, you're emptying yourself and opening yourself to whatever for me enlightenment is every aha moment I have, you know, every light bulb moment is a moment of, Oh, I didn't know that. And I'm enlightened about it. And so that constant emptying of yourself and allowing whatever to filter in, yes, is in an enlightening moment after moment, after moment, after moment. So they, and the, the um, cave dwellers for lack of a better word, they, they too just spent 40 years in a cave in that meditative, open enlightened state i mean we hear dr joe dispenza talk about that here in the usa taking people to that nowhere no thing no body moment and it's just uh you're just nothingness in a way it's very lovely and it takes some practice but in our busy world of work and learning kids and this and that nobody ever gets that still i shouldn't say nobody few people get that still. yeah yeah and I feel like that's growing more and more as we have these types of conversations. We're spreading that word to more people. People are trying new things. They're beginning to make time in their day for even a morning routine that could consist of gratitude. It could consist of prayer, whatever whatever it is for that person, whether it's meditation or another form of reflection and introspection. So thanks for going into those stories. And it's super fascinating, just your trip over there and what you, what you took away. Now, let's talk about you. Yes. So- with what you do with even is it true right so that that's your business name where did that name is it true come from and why did you choose that so for years and years and years let's just quickly step back to like many people especially around my age group had what we would call tsunami childhoods violent strict parents a whole host of things happening and at four years old is when I remember my mother telling me she was going to smack me for something that I had done once she finished gardening. And my four-year-old mind, unbeknownst to me at the time, I saw this much later when, in, when I was digging deep, said, I'm a bad girl and I'm not lovable. Mommy doesn't love me. And probably a few other things. So that took hold and other things developed. 
and they ran my life as do our inner beliefs run they run everybody's life until you stop and learn how to question them and so it got to a point in my life of one bad relationship after another and i'm talking all relationships friends domineering friends aggressive kind of friends it was almost like a bullying kind of thing throughout my life and i would respond because that's all i knew to do and one day i just had enough and it was like how much more of this can i take and this was with my ex-husband and a voice instantly said, you can't. So that started me on the path of seeking. How, how can I change? How can I get rid of whatever I keep attracting? I was like, um, I met, we say Murphy's Law, and I ran around saying, oh, if, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me, like a lot of people do, a lot of teens do. My teen years were miserable, isolated, depressed, et cetera, et cetera. And as I started on this new trek, of reading, of learning, of taking in whatever new information I could take in that started changing my mindset and, and discovering all these underlying beliefs, how to bring them to the surface and question whether they're true, not whether they're right or wrong, just is it, are these beliefs true? So it became, is it true what I'm believing? And the answer is, always no there's no ifs ands and buts about that it's not it's so deeply buried in us and our our body follows the mind so the mind is so conditioned to in this belief it's a form of self brainwashing if you will that you're bad you're you're it's some form of not enough it's not tall enough pretty enough smart enough educated enough not educated educated too much we do it all day long. You know, I could say, oh, I see you're wearing a, um, a gray be better shirt. And you could immediately say to yourself, I know I should have put the red one on. It shows up better on the camera. But, oh, but maybe it'll put <laughs> the curtains behind. And you, you don't even realize you're doing it. You're, you've just got now a story going on. All I said was, oh, you're wearing the gray be better shirt. We do it constantly. You know, driving down the road, car cuts you off. You've already seen the exit, the blood, the gore, the ambulance, and all that happened was the car cut you off. You created this whole story. Or prior to you and I meeting, I might have had a bazillion thoughts around this. Oh, you know, I hope it likes me. I hope the audience likes me. Da, da, da. Is this the right blouse? Is this the right lipstick? And all I'm doing is showing up here to talk about find your beliefs that are a sticking point. And we don't, sometimes we don't know how to do that or or we're not yet ready to dig that deep. So I might I might have a new dress and go down to my husband and say, and he'll be in the middle of one of his best Western TV shows. And I'll say, hey, honey, you know, what do you think of this dress? And he'll look and go, oh, it's nice, and go right back to TV. <laughs> or another kind of person, and I once was, I would have taken that personally. I would have been, that's it, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about me, he doesn't care what I look like, doesn't love me. And all he said was, yeah, it looks good. My mind did that whole number. And if I were to get still with that and find out what triggered me, I'll discover it's all those beliefs I'm believing about myself. He didn't say I don't love you. I told myself he doesn't love me. But what's really going on is I don't love myself. And I'm quick to judge me. And when you become trained to... People say, be in the present moment. What does that mean besides being a buzzword? It simply means keeping your thoughts in one place for an extended period of time. And I've discovered the best way to train yourself to do that, because many of us are so proud of, oh, I'm multitasking. You know, you really can't do one thing properly if you're multitasking. You think you can. But why would you do that to yourself? Why not enjoy this moment? So one quick way to train yourself for the next week or two weeks, however long you'll do this, if you're a right-hander, brush your teeth with your left hand for one week. See how that works out. And you really have to pay attention to moving that brush up. Even if it's an electric brush, you have to focus. So that keeps you really in the present moment. Mm. Where do you put your shirt on? Which arm do you normally put through? Or if you put it over your head first, try putting an arm through 
you really have to be mindful. If you put your right leg in your pants first, switch to the left and with your shoes, with everything, do it with the opposite hand for at least a week and nothing will bring you more present. It's the same with meditation. When the thoughts go drifting, bring them back. And that's the beginning of retraining the mind and the body will follow. The fact that you're even noticing your thoughts have run rampant is the beginning of it. You just have to be aware that now you're doing this. So it'll bring you in the present and it's teaching you consciousness. Wherever our mind goes, the body goes, we get dressed mindlessly. We brush our teeth while we're thinking about the whole day ahead, right? Yeah, not, yeah. Not, we're mindless. <laughs> we, we really are. And I remember when I first started making big shifts in my own life, I was 21 years old and I constantly was in these patterns of complaining and gossiping and everything was against me and people didn't want to listen to me and all these different beliefs that were in my own mind. And I like that the question that you, that became your business, which is, is it true? Are these thoughts real? Are they, or were they manufactured, right? And I like how you said the answer is always no. It's simply a story that we're telling ourselves in our own mind. And I was going to ask you, well, what does that training look like? And I still plan to ask you, what else can we do in order to train ourselves to be in the present, to find these beliefs, to keep track of that mental voice that's happening in our minds. But I like the do the opposite answer. That's really cool. And we, we've heard that before, right? Like, you know, brush your teeth with the opposite hand, do everything different. But we never actually have a day where we do that. So I challenge everyone listening, try going through your day today by doing the opposite. And if you've already like done all those things, which you probably have, then do it tomorrow, right? And do keep tonight. doing it. Yeah, do it tonight. tonight. Exactly, exactly. So sticky note in the bathroom to remind you to do that because it again the mind the body's already following the how the mind has been trained so now you're talking about retraining when you get triggered when someone well let me just back up please so there are three kinds of business there's your business and there's my business and there's the divine's business whatever term you have for the divine the only time you will have discord, anger, whatever it is, even happiness, is when you're in someone else's business, whether it's in your mind or physically in front of you. And if you've ever been, let's say, if you, if you have gone to a physical office at any time or you're meeting up with a friend and you have this entire mental conversation with that person before you meet them, and of course, you always come out the winner in those mental conversations, right? And then you get in front of that person and you might be a bit chilly with them because of the story that you had the whole, they're innocent. They're innocent. They have no idea you've had this conversation with them. So they must be wondering, why are you being so cool with me? What just happened? I'm excited to meet you, right? And it's just a story that we created the whole way down there. Here's your friend, been happy waiting and you show up misery guts you know, it's, <laughs> but if you stay in your business if i comment on your shirt or i say oh you know you should be wearing that today whose business is it what you wear my business right but there i am in your business knowing best for you better for you than what's right for you than you could know for yourself what audacity what arrogance of me to do that and we do it all day long so being in other people's business is, is in itself judgment, correct? Of course, it, you cause your own suffering. If you've had that argument with your coworker that you don't particularly like all the way in, and you're totally in their business telling them how they should behave around you, that's their business. Now, who's uptight when you get there? You are, right? Mm -hmm. You just did that to you. They didn't do that to you. We do it all day long unconsciously. We, ha we are, that person in the mall, you're checking them out for their, you, we don't go to the mall to people watch. As my husband says, we go to people judge. And that's the truth. <laughs> All day long, you are checking people out if you're out in the mall or out in public anywhere, and you are judging them from head to toe. Whose business is it? How they look, how they speak, how they eat, how they wear their hair. And yet we are in their business. But if you're writing and you're doing your own thing or having a cup of coffee and enjoying it 
and you're in your own moment or reading a book, aren't you a happy camper? You're in your own business. There's nothing wrong being in our own business. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, well, when you're sitting there and you do have your own thoughts and you start running those stories in your mind at the same time, you're in your business. But at that point, it's a form of self-judgment, correct? Not necessarily. So if I'm reading a book, I'm just reading a book. And that's where my attention, I'm in the story. And am I judging at that moment? Well, I read mis murder mysteries. So I'm just like, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, and enjoying a cup of tea. I'm just there in my business. I'm not thinking about this one, that one, and judging. There's no suffering in me reading this book. There's no suffering there. If there's a, a natural disaster, an earthquake, and half of a country falls off, I can genuinely feel compassion for those people. At the same time, it's not my business. It's the divine's business. It's a mm. natural I had nothing to do with that. There's nothing I can do about that. So if I get on my high horse and make it my cause, I'm going to be stressed out all the time. And it's me doing it to me. I'm not saying turn a blind eye. And if a, a donation could help and you feel inclined to give a donation, but to stress that the country fell into the ocean, I can't do anything about that. So, but I can help the people that are left on the rest of the piece of land. Does that make sense what I'm saying? But I still don't need to get on my high horse. Here's, here's my mantra. How do I know it should be that way? Or how do I know it should have happened? Because it did. And if I argue with that, I'm arguing with reality. My son passed away uh, six years ago, six years ago in August. And the day I got that news and I was waiting for them to wheel his body out um, of his condo, that was my lifesaver that day. It, it, I didn't make his death about me. And I was obviously as a mom, you know, it's the last piece of news you ever want to hear. But I kept saying, how do I know he should be dead? Because he is. If I hadn't gone into the, oh my God, he shouldn't be dead. I am going to torture myself because I'm just saying, oh, he shouldn't be dead. He shouldn't be dead. I'm arguing with what is, with reality. And that, will, and that is with anything. You know, oh, the, the, the New Orleans shouldn't have been hit with the latest hurricane. Oh my God, those poor people. I don't know if they're poor people. I'm creating a story of their suffering, of the disaster. The news sensationalizes it. It's when I lived in Florida, they took pictures of all the mobile home parks. Well, of course, they're going to be the worst hit because they're the least stable structure. My house was intact, even though the hurricane went right through my area. Mm. Newer construction and to code. But we immediately want to go to the worst case scenario rather than say, rather than see the people that oh, I'm so glad those people are okay. It's like, oh my God, those people are in bad shape. We do that. Why do we do that? <laughs> That's a great question. And we, we do that with everything. We do that with social media, like we were talking about before the show. We'll see other people who seem uber successful at what they're doing. And we start to think the comparison effect, right? We're like, oh, look what they've done with their life. Like people we've graduated with now they've got families. I don't have a family. I don't have a relationship. I don't have all these things. We do it with business, right? If the person doesn't call us back, we're thinking to in our in our minds, like, why aren't they calling us back? Because now we're in their business, right? So it's easier. It's easy to say that. And it's very, it makes sense intellectually. Now, practically, how, what advice would you have for people who find themselves in either the divine's business more often or other people's business more often? How can we reduce that self-imposed suffering that we bring on ourselves? Notice that you're doing it. It's that simple. Oh my God, I'm all wound up. Why? Because I just created this whole flipping story around it. You know, it's like you plan a vacation and you're going to go to Morocco, let's see, let's say, and you book your flight and you book your hotels and everything else, but you can't actually book the outcome or predict the outcome of the vacation. You mm -hmm. hope it's going to be a wonderful time and you know your destination is Morocco, but the truth is, something like COVID or any number of things could happen in between. Or let's say everything goes smooth and you go to Morocco, you could have a lovely time. So you can either sit here 
after you book that vacation and worry yourself to death, and it will probably happen if you focus on it. Oh my God, you know, what if it gets canceled? This, this, this. Or you can say, oh, we are going to have such an awesome time when we sightsee this place and let's do this and can't wait to try the genuine food. It is just as easy to create a positive story as it is a suffering story. And that is, I like to, I, I, I believe, the difference between people who have a positive attitude 90% of the time because they have chosen to look at life that way. Listen, whether you look at life in a miserable way or an upbeat way, each one takes the same amount of work, folks. So, and you're the one in charge. So when you get triggered by something, so now I find it very easy if you were to say, or someone was to come up and say, Sharon, you are a hateful person. And my reaction in the past would most certainly have been defensive. Well, how yeah. are you? you know, let's check. Now I can get quiet for a moment and I can honestly find times in my life when I've been a hateful person. And so I can say, Brandon, thank you. I can find that. Inside of my mind, I will also think, how must I have just been showing up for Brandon to have perceived me that way? Now, I can't control how you perceive me, but I can influence it to some degree. Now, if I show up happy and nice and everything else, you're not more than likely going to perceive me as a hateful person. But mm. I'm willing to take responsibility. I used to say, oh, you made me miserable. You made me feel unhappy. You make me feel miserable. Wrong. You don't do anything. You simply say something to me and I do the rest. Rather than take responsibility for our own actions, it's so much easier to blame somebody else. Somebody says, you walk in the house, somebody jumps out, scares you, and they say, boo. Oh my God, you scared me. Not at all. They just said, boo. Your mind envisioned the boogeyman or whatever, you know, terrorize you in that moment. They just said, boo. No different than saying hi. Your mind just interpreted it differently. So when we take responsibility for how we are acting and reacting and how we are going up in front of others, creates that awareness. That is the retraining of the self. And as you take your focus off the negative thing, stop, to catch yourself deliberately seeking and saying negative things, start listening to podcasts. So, you know, they say you're like the five people you're surrounded. That could be online people. It can be uplifting on people like Brendan Burchard in the business world, you know, never, his energy level is off the charts. If you're into metaphysical, listen to Abraham Hicks, nothing more enlightening and, or, or Eckhart Tolle, he, and Don Miguel Ruiz. Don Miguel in the four agreements talks about always doing your best. And we are even the serial killer in that moment, he's murdering somebody in that demented mindset, that's the best he could do. A second later, he might have a different thought about mm. it. Mar Marvin Gaye's father, perfect example, shot his son. And you can be sure he regretted it a second later. But in that deranged, angry moment, that was the best he could do. And a second later, I'm sure he was like, oh, my God, what have I done? So you have to catch yourself. You have to... Notice when you're angry. Anger is simply a form of control. But underneath that anger, so I'm royally PO'd at you. The control piece of that is because you're not doing things the way I think you should be doing them. Underneath that is, and this takes some really getting still, but underneath that, you're not doing it my way is you don't think I'm good enough. You don't think my idea is good enough or what I want you to do is important enough. You don't think I'm important. You don't think I matter. You don't think my thoughts matter. It does take some, some time to get yourself to that point. Okay, so you don't think I'm important enough. Is that true? You don't think I'm important enough? I have no idea. I just said that. You didn't say that to me. I don't matter. Is that true? I don't know, you didn't say it to me. I said it to myself. I'm telling myself I'm not important. I'm not good enough. I'm not 
whatever it is. And people want to argue against that in the beginning. Well, no, you made me feel that way. No, they didn't. This is where mm -hmm. we, we're blaming others for what we are truly doing to ourselves. And it is, we have been trained from very early ages, from our parents to our teachers to our bosses, to look for that approval and the appreciation and the liking and the loving outside of ourselves. You know, the perfect example is that kid in the sandbox just playing away. All of a sudden, the friends, and you built this beautiful little castle, and the friends come like, oh, that's so wonderful. So now you're going to build the next one because you just got all that applause and you want more of it. It starts that simple. And when you learn that, when you understand that you are doing it to yourself, and your life is so miserable and you are so sick and tired of being sick and tired that you're willing to get out of that what's normal for you because that's normal. It's very uh, People stay in abusive relationships because it's normal to them. I was watching something yesterday about parent, this girl whose parents had kept her locked in a dog cage until she was four and that was discovered and she was asked by the interviewer, um, do you, did you realize that? And she said, well, no, it's just normal to me. And because you're trained, it's normal. To us, we're like, oh my goodness, you know, your whole life in a dog cage, it's just incomprehensible. Again, mm -hmm. we're comparing though, to this little girl, it was normal. To us, it's like a freak out moment, right? So it's, again, I'm not saying it's right. I'm simply saying it's perspective. And when we take the onus for our own life, then things begin to shift. And after a while, when you understand it's you doing it to you, it's a slightly frustrating because you can't blame anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you have to take that responsibility. So to just rewind and recap, understanding the three kinds of business, training yourself that when you get triggered, and you might not be able to do it in that moment initially, but as you train yourself to sit down and reflect, gosh, what was I believing about myself in that moment that's just not true? Well, you don't even say it's not true. Once you recognize the belief, ask yourself, is it true? They don't think or whatever the situation was. And you'll find it's no, it's never true. They didn't even say that to you. They just said something else, you know, no to your suggestion. You're the one that did the rest of it in time you're you'll be in that new mindset and the body will you know if you brushed your teeth with the opposite hand for two months it would become so easy to do that you wouldn't even maybe realize which hand you're actually using because you don't need to be cognizant of it anymore if you're on autopilot again that's how it is so if you train yourself instead of watching news and feeding into that negativity all day Go on YouTube and find some fun things to watch, you know, the funny cat things or dog things or funny people or America's Got Talent and all that beautiful talent out there. Listen to podcasts that are uplifting and will begin to get your line of thinking in a different track. That's real eye-opening. Try meditation. See if you can do five minutes of meditating and if your thoughts wander, Bring them back and notice, well, good, I brought them back. That's an awareness you're starting to create and bring yourself back into that's consciousness. So when people say, oh, you're going to live consciously, what does that mean? It means just keeping track of your thoughts, bringing them back, bringing them back, bringing them back. And retraining yourself, do those opposites for a while and see if you can make yourself ambidextrous. Why not? That could be a fun challenge, right? Well, let me see if I can become great. Of course you can. You can become the wealthiest person, the most prosperous person, because we're wealthy and abundant in many areas. Prosperous, if you want money, we are the same as any other person. It's our belief system that's not there. Once you change your belief system and train it, that you can truly have, there are no obstacles in your way. If you can't read there's reading programs at YouTube, how to read, how to sew, how to become a mechanic. I've learned more household 
repair things off of YouTube and I've done them and I've been pretty proud of myself. So we all have the same opportunity in life. You don't believe me? Look at um, how many, how many non-royal people have married into royalty. It's a perfect example. Doesn't make them any more special. You can position yourself to be in the right place at the right time. You want to travel the world? Become a, a tour guide. There's so many ways we can get what we want. You don't have to have the money to travel the world. Become a tour guide with one of these big companies. They'll take you travel. You just <laughs> uh, seriously, right? We we put these blocks up because we are so narrow focused. Open that focus, and it's a friendly universe that will deliver to you. Has that been your experience? You wanted a podcast, and how? What's your story? Yeah, no, it's it, you're absolutely right. I think you said a lot of great things there, and I. Th- I think the thing that struck home to me was a few things. It was the not being reactive to when someone says something like what you said, like you are you are being a hateful person or you are a hateful person. What really helped me to change my life was exactly what you said, not immediately reacting and responding with, oh, well, why do you think that? What makes you think that? I'm not a hateful person. And it, then it becomes a back and forth and you're you're fueling that insult with your own self-talk. And like you said, that's just, that's that's you, right? It's difficult, at least at first, and it's hard to take that and accept that responsibility but it's liberating to take responsibility. And while it can be painful, pain is inevitable. This is a quote I heard from, I think it's Tony Robbins. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And when you're able to take that responsibility, you are shedding that suffering because now you are the one who has the power to do something about that. Now, at the, before we talked, we were chatting about the youth right? And we were chatting about social media and just the struggle with youth and and self-love. And my question relates to youth, but it also relates to everybody else. You mentioned some great ways for us to positively fuel our mind with podcasts and being around other like-minded people and influences. What are some steps we can take every day that can help us to love ourselves? So, Many people are already familiar with Louise Hay and the mirror work. And Louise is go in front of the mirror and say, I love you several times throughout the day. When you first start that, you feel ridiculous. You're like, I don't love you at all. Look at those eyes and wrinkles. and nah, 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 nah. The purpose of mirror work is to see what comes up. And so notice and write it down. If it's like, oh, you're an ugly so-and-so or your ears are too big. And right, those are your beliefs about yourself. Is it true? Your ears are too big. What are you comparing it to? Compared to Dumbo, your ears are fine, you know, kind of. (laughs) So, I mean, we, again, we are doing it to ourselves. So that mirror work, the salad story is one I tell every time. Again, it comes with our upbringing and our training. So Louise talked about making a salad and we'll go to our fridge and those little cherry tomatoes are starting to get a bit crinkly. Great, not a problem. They're not rotten yet. The cucumbers are a bit soggy, so you cut that nasty piece off and do the rest and break the, break the brown pieces of the lettuce, put it in a bowl, and now you've got yourself a decent salad. Would you serve that salad to company? No. Would you? Would you serve that kind of a salad to your friends? No. You go buy all new produce, right? Why? Are you doing more for others than you would do for yourself? Mm. Then it's that programming. Let company go first. Let them sit first. Let them go through the door first. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody gets to go before us. Why? You know, I'm hungry too. Pass that plate, you know, bowl here. Let me serve myself. It'll get around to them eventually. I'll save them some. It's our early training of, you know, even in class, get in line and know so-and-so will be at the head of the line. And again, you're relegated to the back here. We do it all the time. We're taught it's polite to open the door for so-and-so and let them through first. Well, my appointment is before them. I need to get in there now, you know. So, <laughs> and we've all done stuff like that. You go to the restaurant, the movie, hurry up, park before they get in. They just park same time, you know. It's it's crazy what we do. But if you if you would not do it for somebody else, then don't put them before you. 
I'm sorry, that came out wrong. If you would do it for somebody else first and not yourself, stop it. You've got to become ultra conscious of your habit of doing that because that's all it is, is a habit. And again, retraining yourself. When you go make a salad, if it's not, and oh, don't waste food, don't waste food. How do you know it's being a waste? Put it out there for the birds, for the rabbits, for the wildlife, they'll come and get it. If you live in the city, then you are gonna have to dump it or get in the habit of buying smaller quantities and eat it more quickly. So that bit of guilt trip, you know, starving kids in Europe. When we moved back to Europe, I asked my mother, are we now one of the star starving families in Europe? We all heard something like that growing up and that'll lead me into the one-liners. So again, being mindful, we, many of us have said, oh, I give the shirt off my back for my friend. Keep your shirt, folks. <laughs> so we're again, trained to do so. I give my last dollar. Keep your last dollar because you're going to need it. When you're in a position to comfortably help the other person, then help them, but don't short yourself. We've been taught to do that over and over and over. It's so ingrained in us. It's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know what the word is here. It's a bad habit, in my opinion. Good or bad, I'm labeling, don't want to label. Take care of yourself first. Become yeah. conscious. When you are ready to let that person go first, when you nearly knock down your friend to pay for them and you only have a little bit of money, don't do that. You deny them the privilege of feeling good about paying for your lunch and it's training you into acceptance. Nice shirt you got. Oh, this little thing I got at a you know, Walmart. Nothing wrong with Walmart, but it's thank you. Just thank you, right? It's getting out of the habits that we've been taught. That's all. Retraining yourself, retraining yourself, become mindful of what you're saying. Slow your life. Really, the easiest way is to slow your life down. Because if you're a speed speaker, start speaking more slowly. If you multitask, cut it down to one or two tasks, not five tasks at one time. Because you're exhausting yourself. You're stressing yourself out in order to impress somebody. But you don't. We have no control over what anybody else thinks of us. We've been trained to act that way, especially a people pleaser. If you've had a rough childhood, you get people pleasing habits as a survival mechanism. It's also manipulation, though. If I behave a certain way, you'll love me more, whatever it is. But we don't even know if that's true. Is it true they'll love you more if you? Do a Cirque du Soleil act? No, they might think you're a nutcase. You know, <laughs> we have no control over, and they have no control over how we perceive them. That's another freeing lesson. Giving up your need to be right is the fastest way I know to pe a peaceful life. Who cares whether they're right or wrong? In their reality, they're right. Something I heard recently was, to tell yourself it's real and not true. It's real and not true. Because in your mind, it's real, but it's not true. It's mm. just a story you made up. So moving into social media, what I fully understand, and I really would like everybody to understand and embrace this, when you post something on any platform of social media, including LinkedIn, many Many times it's checked to see how many likes you get or how much acknowledgement. And the tendency is to take it personally. It is not personal. Think of when you are checking like on somebody else's, you're not liking the person, you're liking the post. And the post has nothing to do with the person. Mm -hmm. When people are liking what you put out there, they're liking your post. It's not that they're liking you. They Most of them don't even know you. They're just following you. How can they even know to like you? They're liking the post, period. Nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with, oh, you put a brilliant post. It just happens they like the post. Some do, some don't. End of the story. I look at some of the, some of the things that I see on mostly Instagram and I see some of the saddest things out there. Young people just so ready to be done with life. 
because they're basing the likes and not likes and the feeling of being disconnected in the world rather than connected and they don't know how to get connected and getting connected is all these things that I've talked about is checking in with what you're believing about yourself. And sometimes, believe me, I'm not a doctor. So if it's a, a um, I don't know what the right word is, but if it is something that is deeper than just beliefs and you need medication and you do need to see a psychologist, psychiatrist for that, then by all means do. That doesn't mean you can't still in investigate and explore your beliefs as you find out they're not true they drop away unless there's a belief underneath that that needs to keep it in place and then when you find that it's gone it's just it's it's so freeing to see that belief you've been carrying that's been running your life that's been attracting the same people same situations has never been true you literally feel a weight you feel a, a physical change when you uncover and realize it's never been true I also, another part of my business, and it all falls under this, is a blueprint for stress release. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. It, it relieves all this stress to perform, and I have to do this. You know, I found myself in a full-time day job that I had already burned out on, and there was a, a freeze on any further sales for a month. So... I've been driving myself 45 minutes to this job, back each way 45 minutes to a job I didn't like and I couldn't even make money at for another 30, 30 days. So it was costing me to go to a job I didn't like. And I came home and I said, oh, I've been doing the definition of insanity. I'm done. I handed in my notice the next day. I thought, it's me doing it to me. Nobody's twisting my arm to go to the job every day. But I had this thought, Oh my God, it's COVID and all these people out of work and da, 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 da. I'm far from perfect. I'm still exploring as well. But when I stopped and thought, what are you doing? You're doing this to you, nobody else. I said, all right, this is where you have absolute blind faith. There's something better around the corner. And now instead of doing it part-time, I do what I love full-time. And I'm happy, I'm relaxed, that I felt the weight go off my shoulders. Yet we stay in positions, whether it's a job or relationship or whatever. You know, people, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not labeling anything. People are in an unhappy relationship. I'm gonna use this as an example. Really unhappy relationship. And perhaps they stay in it because they have a belief that the kids will suffer if the parents separate. Well, is that true, that your kids will suffer? Do you not think they're suffering now, feeling the tension and hearing the arguments and everything else? Or let's make it a little more severe. Your partner has cheated on you, maybe once or twice, and you want to keep this partner in your life. Do you really think that trying to hold this person in a relationship that they don't want to be in, and you say you love this person, why wouldn't you want to set them free and set yourself free? You'll be for, I don't know this to be true, but more than likely, every time they come home a minute late or something similar happens, you're going to be in torture yourself, wondering, are they cheating on you again, it's not even really cheating, they're just following their preference. And you want to hold this person who you feel is treating you miserably when really it's you treating you miserably and now you have a hostage on top of it. You really want that, that kind of life going forward? Do you want to subject your children to that? And it's that fear of the unknown. But what if you had a, instead of a fear of the unknown, what if you had a curiosity about the unknown? Oh, I wonder what it's going to bring me going forward, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you just gave a wealth of information when it comes to, you know, fueling that self-love versus the adverse with both. You got the mirror effect there. You have taking a look at what you're saying and it's real, it's happening, but it's not 
true, yeah. which brings us back to the first discussion. So I, I know you just mentioned the blueprint for stress relief, but why don't you tell us just maybe a, a minute about that, who it's for and where we can find that. Okay. So blueprint for stress release.com and is it true.com blueprint for stress release is a self-study course with the same foundational things the very first lesson in both courses gives you an opportunity to do something that will immediately bring up all your underlying beliefs the rest of the course is setting up different scenarios where you can question to see if it's even true and ultimately you're looking at it from a different perspective and uncovering what's really been going on there is it true is a six-week course of a same similar curriculum however once a week we're meeting as a group you have an opportunity to work with me directly i'm happy to facilitate answer any questions anywhere you might have gotten stuck and every once in a while i offer a package of individual uh, facilitation such ses coaching sessions and if you have questions or would like to set up a free call to discuss this, you can reach out to info at isittrue.com and I'll reach out and we can set up a time to talk about it. I will be away for the next week. Um, so going on a cruise. I am. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nothing short of a miracle and people I've worked with hundreds of people and you can read the testimonials. I don't know these people's backgrounds, and when I see what they write back and and I can physically see the changes in the people when I'm working one on one, it's so rewarding to see the enlightened moments happen for them throughout. And I say right up front in the courses, please do not sign up for the course if you're not going to be serious about it because you're just wasting your money. If you're at that point where you really want your life to be better and peaceful and calm and the way you've always envisioned your life to be and haven't achieved it, then pursue the courses. If not, then if you're not ready, don't do it. Yeah. Well said. You. you heard it here. Blueprint for stress release.com or is it true.com to check out the blueprint. If you want to experience a better life, more peace, more awareness, more self-love and bliss. Sharon, what an excellent conversation. Thank you for bringing us through this journey from your own experiences and people you've worked with. And I look forward to hearing more from you and following you with all the work that you release. Thank you. What a great conversation. We dived into our thoughts, we dived into our emotions, which create the rest of our life. We talked about taking ownership of how we feel, right? Taking ownership of what others even say, where we can maybe find a time in our life where that rings true. We talked about the importance of awareness. We talked about how you can practice self-love and fuel more powerful, positive emotions through associations and positive content and a lot of different things in this hour that Sharon and I spoke. So I know you found some value in this conversation. And if you want to take this further with Sharon Valenti, then you can go to isittrue.com or you can check out her blueprint for stress release directly at isittrue.com or the blueprint for stress release.com to follow her more closely. Sharon, it was an awesome conversation. And for all of you who watch this and you've got one thing that you're going to use going away from this conversation, which I sure hope you do, the price of admission for listening or watching this show is to simply share it with one person who could also use this message. That's the price of admission. Share this with your social media. Share this with your friend because our message is our goal is to get this message to as many people to help them make positive progress in their own life and their own emotions. Thank you so much for watching and staying tuned. And until next time, continue to be better.